One manufacturer wants to give us the best of both worlds, but are they on the right track? That's this week on Motoring 2000. TSN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Well, this week we are in a dump. Now, I'll tell you why later on. But first, it wasn't that long ago when car manufacturers were building vehicles they thought we wanted, even if we didn't. Well, of course, that's ancient history now that we've got a dealer on every corner selling a different model. Now they're building what we want. And what do people want today? They want trucks, and the car makers are making a ton of money off them. Take Ford, for instance. The F-Series pickup truck has been number one for years. They may sell close to a million this year. And the Ford Explorer Sport Utility, they're ready for this. They sold just over 340,000 of them last year alone in the United States. So when the Ford designers gaze into their crystal ball, what did they see for the future? Well, they saw a vehicle that would combine the pickup truck and the sport utility, and they call it the Sport Track. This was the scene at last year's Detroit Auto Show as Nissan unveiled the SUT concept vehicle. What we created then was a car with a clean zone and a dirty zone. And at the same time, a tough bed. And, uh, and we knew right away that this idea had legs. Nissan's this chief designer Jerry Hirschberg was right, but now Ford is the first out of the gate with the 2001 Explorer Sport Track. Being first is always a big, a big splash and you get a lot of the weight. I, I don't think it's as big a deal for us on this one. The Explorer heritage is very strong. Uh, the sport is out there. So I think this one will do it right rather than rush to be first with it. Today there's about 22 different SUVs in the market. Uh, in two years there'll be 42 and we think by the year 2005 there'll be over 70 SUVs in the marketplace. And so the trick really is to get a good identity around our brand, which is this whole Ford Outfitters No Boundaries campaign, and make sure we put the customer in the right vehicle. They're looking to sell more always, I guess. That's the thing. I mean, they're talking about a record 800,000 plus F-150s, and, and they want to you know, find new ways to sell these trucks. I think it's a very valid idea. It's nice to think, you know, if you or I phone up and with an idea, they'll probably build it, you know. I mean, that's, it's not far removed from that, and yet you think, you know, what possibilities still remain? I mean, will they come up with another uh, rumble seat? You know, maybe, you know, why not? We believe this vehicle is going to be ideal for the Canadian market, as uh, Canadians are worried about affordability. A vehicle with the versatility of the sport track, the ability to combine the best features of a SUV with the functionality of a pickup box, it's ideal for someone looking to maybe uh, take two vehicles and make it into one for them. So we think this vehicle is going to uh, be a home run for Ford of Canada. Everybody now realizes that the market is there to stay. I mean, you see people like Jaguar coming in, you see people like Porsche preparing themselves for a sport youth next year. So everybody is uh, jumping in the bandwagon. So what Ford basically wants to do is probably take one step further and go in something that nobody has thought of it production-wise as a vehicle. What Ford Motor Company is experiencing now is that they've kind of reached a plateau in terms of trucks. Uh, trucks are driving the profits for the whole company uh, globally. And so what they need to do is find a way to expand the truck market in a different way. Now you asked me whether it's going to sell. Uh, I think it will sell uh, primarily because it's different. The real question though, is it going to cannibalize sales from other products? That's a big question. We're concerned about that, but I, I also think you need to give people products they want. And so I think we'll grow the category. There'll be some cannibalization. 
but I also think you'll retain people longer. So the more variety you have, you'll bring somebody into the Ford family, and I think then it's when you'll trade them up into either the two-door or the four-door. So we'll cannibalize ourselves a little bit, but I think we'll grow the category and grow more loyal customers. Today, we're much more in tune with what consumer needs are, and that's the starting point for all the programs. This vehicle is a, a very good example. We were going out and talking to SUV owners, and they were constantly saying, I hate putting my muddy old uh, off-road bike in, in my SUV. It always gets dirty. I can't haul topsoil. I can't haul my gardening supplies. It just gets my SUV dirty. Sport Track's ideal for that kind of a buyer. With trucks, I mean, you've got you've to expand the to use one of these scientific terms, the paradigm. You know, you've got to, to spread out and say it's not just a, a utility vehicle, it's a lifestyle vehicle. And that's what we're seeing with things like a, a sport track or a frontier crew cab, is you're seeing, uh, you know, you're making a vehicle that isn't just for hauling lumber in the back. It's a lifestyle vehicle, and it's the kind of thing that, for goodness sake, my wife loves it. She's got place for her gardening stuff, and my kid loves it, my five-year-old, because he likes to play in trucks. I mean, when, so when you look at the paradigm that way, is that it's a whole lifestyle vehicle, it makes sense. <laughs> you know, there's an awful lot of truth to be found in those funny pages. That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. In spite of its tall nature, this vehicle devoured the pylon course. The steering is razor sharp without being too fast, and the body rolls just enough to let you know you're pushing the limits. You know, I've never understood the term sport utility. Most of these vehicles, while they are utilitarian, aren't very sporty. But leave it to BMW to change the rules. And that they've done with the launch of this new X5. The heart of the X5 is found beneath the modestly macho Brightwork. The 4.4 litre V8 that powers both the 5 and 7 series cars is the only engine offered. As with its tarmac-bound siblings, the X5 uses variable intake valve timing to deliver 282 horsepower and 324 pounds-feet of torque at 3600 RPM. It also delivers a 0 to 100 k time of 7.6 seconds and an 80 to 120 time under 6.5. The only trait I do not care for is the overly quick throttle tipping. You know, inside this X5 is every bit a BMW. The seats, well, they're wonderfully supportive, especially if you go with the optional sport package. You get power windows, locks, cruise control, analog gauges, and even a steering wheel that keeps your hands warm in winter just by pushing a little button. To the right of that, a set of radio and climate controls that rank as best in class. The one thing that disappoints is the navigation system. Simply stated, it's difficult to program and doesn't offer the area of coverage it should. And considering it's a $3,000 plus dollar option, it's the one thing you shouldn't bother with. The sole transmission offered is a top-notch five-speed manumatic. The best feature, however, is the manner in which the box is programmed to behave. Not only is it adaptive, as in it learns your driving style, if you lift off the gas quickly entering a corner, it holds that gear. Far too many automatics upshift under these circumstances, upsetting the vehicle's balance. This logic not only allows you to power through corners, it also delivers some much needed engine braking. The only other place the X5 needs a rethink is with the sunroof. When it's open, you get a terrible buffeting sound anywhere between 45 and 60 kilometers an hour. The only way to quell the din is to play around with a sunroof or open and close one of the rear windows, neither of which is a particularly good option considering the cost of this vehicle. The all-wheel drive system is split mechanically 3862 in favour of the rear wheels and is very different in that it uses open centre differentials. The diff is the part of the system that allows the wheels to rotate at different speeds without damaging the vehicle. Problem is, if one wheel's on loose stuff, that's where all of the power goes. Now BMW counter this negative by using the anti-lock brake system. If one of the wheels begins to spin, the brake is applied and the power automatically redirected. Now the problem is, and you had to know that there would be a drawback, 
what BMW do when they brake a spinning wheel, you're obviously overheating the brakes if you allow that to happen for a prolonged period. So what they do, BMW shut down the horsepower. Now on road, you're unlikely to run into any situation where the brakes are on so long that you begin to lose the horsepower. However, if you venture too far off road, when that pea soup becomes real thick, horsepower is the only thing that's going to see you through. And that's the one thing the X5 won't give you. Suspension-wise, the X5 mirrors the 5 Series sedan, featuring a sophisticated strut-based design up front and a multi-link system in back. In spite of its tall nature, this vehicle devoured the pylon course. The steering is razor sharp without being too fast, and the body rolls just enough to let you know you're pushing the limits. The beauty being that the ride does not beat you up. It is the benchmark in the sport ute category, as are the anti-lock brakes. They haul this vehicle to a stop in an incredibly short period. Nothing comes close to equaling their performance. You know, the X5 really is a rule breaker and primarily because it offers enough performance to outgun many a fine sports car. True enough, it's not particularly good in the off-road environment, but given that 90% of these vehicles never see the backwards, who am I to argue with BMW's new direction? Time to update our long-term Mazda MPV. Now this newly designed vehicle has been a long time coming for Mazda, and they've been able to cherry pick the best ideas from the competition. But having said that, they've actually one-upped everyone else. Now when you get into the back of other minivans, and you're the passenger, and you're looking for a little fresh air, you're out of luck, but not in the MPV, because the windows actually go up and almost down. But nevertheless, Good for the passengers, and you know what? Even the family dog will probably give it to Baza. Our Midas tip of the week concerns alternators. The alternator in your vehicle was intended to keep the battery fully charged and maintain all the accessory load on the vehicle, but it was never designed to recharge a dead or faulty battery. But in a lot of cases, we motorists tend to use it for just that purpose. When the battery dies, we boost the car and then drive it around long enough for the alternator to supposedly bring up that battery to a full state of charge. It was never designed to do that, and in many cases, one such incident can finish off your alternator or do some damage to it. So I strongly suggest that if you kill the battery in your vehicle, if at all possible, get a battery charger on it and give it a full charge before you restart the vehicle. Now, if circumstances are such that you absolutely cannot do that and have to boost it and drive it somewhere, Keep the accessory load to a bare minimum, keep the vehicle speed up so that the alternator gets lots of cooling and get it quickly to a garage where you can have that battery given a full and proper charge from a battery charger. That'll add a lot of life to your alternator. That's your Midas tip of the week. Does the tune sound familiar? Well, it should, because it's the opening theme for motoring. And the man behind the music is Steve Shelsky, who for the past 13 years has written all the music you hear each week on motoring. I started off in um, music uh, professionally, I suppose, after leaving college and uh, studying music and arranging and composing. Back in the early 70s, I, um, I joined a rock band called Coney Hatch. We got a record deal and, and we uh, went on to do uh, three records. We went gold and, and we, did, we did quite well with that. From there I went on to um, play with uh, Gowan, who's a, a fairly popular artist in the 80s. From then I, I went on to uh, work in um, writing music for television. 
That's when I started working on uh, the motoring show back in 89. Well, I, I have a 63 Corvette. I bought it in 1974, and it was about 16 at the time, which I guess I'm giving my age away. <laughs> it's gone through some changes. I've rebuilt it a few times. All the cars from 63 to 67, the Corvettes, were, were uh, similar in body style, so all the parts are interchangeable. So it's, um, it's just been an evolution, and it's a, it's a neat car. It's a, a fun car. It's inspiring to, to write music for a show like motoring because it's, it's always action, it's neat stuff. For me, it's um, cars are, are neat and, and it's exciting. We're back with our 2001 Explorer Sport Track. A couple of features to show you. One is a power back window, which is an industry first on a vehicle like this. The other is at the back in the cargo area. The short box turns into a seven footer thanks to this extender. Mind you, Nissan already has this on the Frontier crew cab. Now they've put this composite plastic box through 450,000 miles of testing. And I asked them, how do you do that? Well, they said it's quite simple. They just went to a dump like this and they started throwing stuff in. Anything they could find, boulders, uh, pipes and everything. And guess what? No scratching, no scarring, and it's all recyclable. Not bad. Anyway, we're now going to head to the garage and join Bill. And I know we'd all love to know what Bill thinks of this new truck, but right now we're under an embargo. We can tell you about it. We just can't give you any impressions, and that includes Bill. So why don't we head to the garage and see what's on his mind. Well, Brad, we've got an email this week from uh, a viewer named Ryan Elliott. I've summarized his letter to fit on my clipboard here, but here's what he asks. He's asking about idling and fuel consumption. He says, I have a buddy who has a 94 Civic SI Coupe. He harps about not letting the car idle too long because it will take way too much gas. I've seen Bill talk on the show about idling and how if you're stationary for any period of time, you should shut the engine off, except, of course, when in traffic. My question is, is doing so more to protect the engine to save gas or a bit of both? Well, Ryan, it's certainly a little bit of both. Uh, that Civic SI that you see in the background happens to be mine. It's a couple of years older than your friends, but we can certainly use it for our discussion. I can tell you that that car is capable of high 30s fuel mileage, I'm talking miles per gallon, on a bad day and low to mid 40s if driven properly. Any car, this one or otherwise, when it's sitting idling, gives you zero miles per gallon. So why would you want to do it? It just doesn't make sense. Now a little engine like that, of course, doesn't use a whole lot of gas to idle, but it's still zero miles per gallon. So don't do it if you can possibly avoid it. In terms of the engine, when you're at idle, this blade that you see right here, the throttle blade, that's that sort of brass colored blade that you see right there, is in that position. It's closed. As you accelerate the car, you open the throttle, you give the engine more air, but when it comes back to idle, that blade is almost closed, which cuts off the majority of the air entering the engine. So idling is a quite rich mode of engine operation. In other words, a uh, fair amount of fuel and not too much air. Now what that does is when the engine's running rich, it's contaminating the lubricant in the crankcase at a much greater rate than it should. This is why you'll see things like police cars and taxis. When you look up in uh, the owner's manual, it'll specify if your vehicle's be being used for those types of uh, operation, you have to greatly increase the maintenance intervals. You have to change the engine oil and filters much more frequently. An engine that's running at speed leans out when the throttle opens, it gets more air through the throttle and it keeps its uh, crankcase lubricant much cleaner. Also when we're talking about crankcase lubricants, as the engine speed picks up, you get much greater lubrication to all those areas of the engine that are only lubricated by splash, in other words the cylinder walls, etc. Also the cooling system operation is much better when the vehicle's revved up and at speed you get better airflow through the rad, much better dissipation of heat. and the whole works, the whole package just works that much better, so it doesn't make any sense to idle an engine when it's not necessary. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. If you're big into cars, check out MotoringTV.com and while you're at it, download a copy of Autopilot. Autopilot software searches out the matches to your automotive interests and makes the most of your online time.
popular image of a car crash usually involves screeching tires and cars slamming together, twisted metal and broken shards of glass flying in every direction. Of course, the TV guys particularly like the multi-car pileups on the freeway with jackknife tractor trailers and cars crushed under their wheels, film at 11. But I recently got some statistics from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, and they suggest that something like 40% of all traffic fatalities arise from single car crashes, which I found amazingly high. Now we know that some of these crashes are due to fatigue, not just drivers falling asleep at the wheel, but even after two hours of driving, we know that your vision tends to drop as you get mesmerized by the dotted lines on the road. When that happens, you can't keep the car in the middle of the lane, you tend to drift over to the shoulder, the stones kick up into the wheel wells, and you overcorrect, roll the car over. Sometimes you take out an innocent victim, in which case it's no longer a single car crash, but for the most part, we're doing those solo. We also know that alcohol and other drugs are often involved. We also know that a lot of those are suicides. Now, the police can't tell exactly when it is a suicide, but if they see a situation where the road is dead straight, no weather issues, the guy who normally wears a seatbelt isn't wearing a seatbelt, the speeds are very high, there's no sign of any steering or braking, but if there's no corroborating evidence, like a suicide note, well, it goes down in the traffic accident report as a car lost control. Well, of course the car never loses control. It's the driver who loses control, or more likely, abandons control. In other words, it's driver error. Now, while it's convenient to always blame our problems on somebody else, look at all those terrible drivers out there. They're all trying to kill me. They shouldn't have a license. The fact is we have to heed the words of the wisest of American political philosophers and unwitting traffic expert, Pogo the Possum, who once said, I have seen the enemy and he is us. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, that's it for this week. As I mentioned earlier, currently we're under an embargo on the sport track, so I can't tell you what I think about it. But stay tuned, because you know on a future program, Graham will be getting behind the wheel of the sport track on Test Drive. And make sure you tune in next week as we present our annual Car of the Year program. We pick the best for the year 2000. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.